Hi again. Thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Business Confidential. I am Matthew Dykes from Guerrilla Media, where we share your story, build your brand, and grow your business with video that works for you. Um, and as always, I'm here with my trusty producer, Diana Salas, uh, from Studio 239, the absolute best podcast studio in Southwest Florida. And uh, today we are joined by my guest, Blake Day, and he is the owner and president of Day Adjusting and Consulting. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got some great things to cover today. Uh, I'm really excited about this because this is something that's near and dear to my heart because um, we have gone through some things where having uh, someone like Blake um, is is one of the best commodities you can have. Uh, and so um, I didn't mean that to sound like uh, so insincere. Uh, like you're not just a commodity. You're a person. We appreciate well, thank that. You. <laughs> No, but really your skills are a commodity and, um, it's something that people, um, they, they don't know they need it until they need it. Right. Yes. So, um, there are so many things going on that are natural catastrophes that are happening all over some small, some big, um, and people are facing things, uh, all the time that they need, uh, to report to their insurance. Um, especially weather wise, weather wise is something that, you know, we, we all here in Southwest Florida can relate to because of the hurricanes and because of just, you know, the, the, the damage that they did over the last, what, five to seven years now. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd gone so long without having anything like that happen. Um, but you know, out of some of those horror stories, there are some good things that come about. And so uh, I would love to hear some of the things that you can share with us. We do have, um, you do have one story I definitely want to make sure we get to today. And that's uh, the alligator in the basement uh, story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what, let's start with, um, how did you get here? Are you from, are you from this area? I'm originally from small town in Indiana, uh, just outside of Muncie, Indiana. Okay. Uh, grew up there, went to Ball State University. And I uh, actually came down to Florida for the first time when I was a high schooler with my parents and uh, never seen the ocean before. I think we came down to Miami and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a life outside of my small little farm town. And uh, it was always a dream to move to Florida. So after college, uh, that's what I did. I actually moved over to Miami for the first several years. I was here in Florida. I uh, loved it over there. Uh, it's a little, little too high pace of a life for me. Uh, it seems like there's something to do every night, which makes it a little hard to focus on your career. Yeah. So eventually found my way over to this coast and fell in love with it. Good. All right. So that is, uh, a, a, a very similar story to myself. I, I came down here from Cincinnati, so we're from oh, uh, the yeah. same neck of the okay. woods, uh, not too far apart there. Um, but yeah, Miami has got quite the scene and it would be kind of hard to, to stay focused and keep that laser focus on, yeah. on your goals and things like that. Um, so is that when you got into the insurance business? Yeah, I got in the insurance business. So it would have been right around 2009. Um, I actually started working for the insurance companies as a catastrophe adjuster. So really any catastrophe from 2009 through almost 2019, if you saw it on TV, I was probably there. You know, we'd fly in next day after wildfires, earthquakes, hailstorms, tornadoes, and of course the hurricanes. Uh, you know, we worked over uh, New York, Superstorm Sandy, um, West oh, Coast, yeah. big windstorms, fires. Um, yeah, if you saw it on the news, high likelihood I was probably there within a day or two after the event. So you started out with the companies. And so, um, but now you're a public adjuster. Yep. So what made you make the switch? There was a big change in the insurance industry, um, especially right around the time of Hurricane Irma. Um, what I noticed was, you know, I used to go out there and I would help people, you know, I'd, I'd go out, work for the insurance companies, you know, like a good neighbor or you're in good hands, you mm -hmm. know, some of the national brands say, and uh, we'd go out there, assess the damage, write an estimate. And our goal was to try to make sure, you know, we provided the homeowner with what they needed to get their house back the way it was after the storm. Um, we started to see a shift in how that happened. And, you know, insurance companies for the most part are for-profit businesses, you know, especially the ones that are public. And at the end of the day, you know, they also want to make, you know, a profit for their shareholders and profit for the company. Sure. They're a business. Yeah. yeah. So we started to see a big shift to where I used to be an insurance adjuster and I slowly started to joke that I was just a picture taker because I could go out there, take the photo, spend hours with the homeowner or the business owner um, looking at the property, but they would get to the point where whatever I would tell the insurance company needed to be done. Hey, we need to pay for this. Hey, we need to address this. Hey, we need to get an engineer. 
didn't matter. Uh, when it went to the insurance company, they simply looked at the dollar amount of the loss rather than the details and what caused the damage. And at that point, I started to realize that there was more of a need in the industry to represent, you know, people and business owners than there was to represent the insurance companies. Because, you know, insurance companies, you know, they've their whole business is structured around, you know, collect premiums and don't pay them back out. But for homeowners, you have to think, you know, every time you turn on the TV, whether it's, you know, basketball game, football game, you see all of these, uh, you know, trust your agent, trust your insurance company. You know, they really, they really push that out there. You know, trust us, you're in good hands, we'll take care of you. But it's not until a, an event happens that you realize that that's not always the case. So, you know, we saw um, an area in the market where, you know, there just wasn't enough skilled people. Um, so with me, you know, working on, you know, the dark side, working on the insurance company <laughs> side for, uh, you know, a decade, you know, I had the skills and the knowledge to know not only how to beat the insurance companies, but also how to, um, you know, effectively try to, you know, get these claims closed quick, give the insurance companies what they want and give people peace of mind. So we made the switch. Um, and I remember when I was actually making the switch, I was working with um, a bunch of attorneys who were actually really trying to convince me. And they were uh, plaintiff attorneys that represented homeowners. And they said, man, you're so knowledgeable. Why don't you make the switch to our side? And um, I remember them asking me, you know, what's your biggest concern if you were to start your own business and do this? And it sounded probably pretty arrogant at the time, but I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to grow too quickly, you know, that we're going to be so successful that I won't be able to keep up. And they kind of laughed at me and I'm like, I'm, I'm serious. I think there's that big of a need in the market. And shortly after I started the company in the first six months, I mean, things exploded. I was hiring as many people as I could, bringing on as many people as I could. Mm. And, and obviously all these natural disasters we keep having across the country. And then here in Florida, yeah. it has been nonstop for five, six, you know, almost six years now of having the business. And some days it's hard to keep up and, uh, you know, in trying to find enough skilled workers who know, you know, how to handle insurance claims, you know, right. it's not something for the most part, there's a specific major in at college universities. You know, most people that end up in insurance have degrees in wildly different things, psychology and, you know, some kind of a fitness degree or exercise science degree. People stumble, the, stumble their way into insurance simply because, there's so much opportunity there. Even during a recession, you still have to have insurance. Most you know, certainly. So it's one of those industries where um, there's always a job, there's always a need, but trying to find enough skilled workers is always the key. So at what point, let, let's say, let's just take a, uh, an example. Let's, let's say there's a hurricane that comes through. You've got some severe damage to, to your home and the insurance company sends out their adjuster like you used to be. Yeah. At what point in the process should a consumer actually go, I appreciate that you're sending this out. I would like to get my own adjuster. It, at what point in the process should they be thinking about that? That has changed dramatically in the last five, six years, just since I've had the business. Before, what I would tell people is, you know, hey, let's see what your insurance company says. You know, if they give you enough money and you got what you need, call us afterwards. Um, but what we found out after Hurricane Irma, that was the case. You know, probably three to six months after the hurricane is when we got busy. People started calling us, hey, I'm not getting the settlement I need. My contractor's a lot higher. What do I do? What we noticed, there was a hurricane that hit, uh, it was Hurricane Ida, I believe, that hit New Orleans where we have another office. And the hurricane hit, and we didn't expect to start getting a lot of calls for months. The next day, we were taking hundreds of calls. People had lived through Hurricane Katrina and had realized then that, hey, I didn't get help on my insurance claim. I ended up fighting my insurance company for three to five years before I got a settlement. I'm not going down this road again. We were honestly caught off guard. We, we didn't have the manpower for yeah. the amount of phone calls we had. Um, I personally started taking claims, you know, because I, I got to a point in the business where I was kind of running the thing. Mm -hmm. And I became an employee of my own business where I was taking, I took on hundreds and hundreds of clients just because we had nowhere else to put them and I didn't want to turn them down. And this last hurricane that hit Florida, uh, Ian, the exact same situation. You know, uh, the night before the hurricane, I do a conference call with the company and everyone's saying, hey, how busy do you think it's going to be? And I'm saying, everybody, hold on. I think it's going to be a lot of calls tomorrow because people yeah. have been through Irma. People fought for it. We have clients that when Ian hit, they were still in litigation on their Irma claim, hadn't even settled it yet. So I heard, okay, so I heard that and yeah. I, I was just dumbfounded. I mean, gobsmacked. I had no idea yeah. that five and six years down the road, uh, because we had, that was when we took our total loss on our house yeah. and I fought them. I was, we were talking earlier before the show. Um, I fought them every day for eight solid months. It was a full-time job, yeah. eight solid months. I was on the phone five, six, sometimes seven hours a day, 
going from person to person until like, because I was not accepting up. We had just purchased the house, brand new house. We'd owned it for three months. We just furnished it Mm -hmm. and they wanted to give me $17,000 was not going to happen. So that, that fact that someone continued to fight for, it drove me crazy. I mean, I, 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 I had so many ups and downs and Cause you're, you're just depressed. You have no place to live. We were, you know, we're living out of the backs of cars and with yep. friends. And I mean, it is a tough road to hoe when you've got people helping you. Yeah. But I'm, I can't imagine having to be fighting this for five and six years and still no resolution. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty wild. We still have today. I, I have some cases coming up for trial. Um, you know, and we try to keep them out of litigation if we can, but sometimes yeah. if insurance companies just stop responding and they don't want to work, you know, they end up there. And we have some cases coming up for trial this fall that are Hurricane Irma cases that still have not been settled by these insurance companies. So, and because of that, you know, when this latest hurricane hit in Florida, we were taking almost 200 calls a day, seven days a week, and it, it we couldn't keep up. It, it was the craziest time of my entire life because so many people that have been through Irma had learned their lesson. Oh, yeah. So it, a very long answer to your question, you know, when should someone get a public adjuster involved? It seems like nowadays, it's almost like if you get in a car accident tomorrow, you don't fight the insurance company on your own. You almost go find an attorney. It's getting to the point with insurance where people almost need to seek representation immediately after. Because those that did, you know, probably the first few thousand clients that we signed up, we've settled all of their cases. I always tell people the, long, really? the longer you wait to get assistance on your claim, the longer the tail's going to be. So insurance companies are always quick to pay in those first six months because it's a big national news story. Mm -hmm. After that, they're on to the next news story. So these insurance companies start dragging their feet. They're a little more behind. You know, clients that were signing up, you know, just last week, you know, they call me and say, hey, how long do you think until you can settle my case? I say, best case scenario, you know, we can get you settled sometime between August and Christmas. You know, and they're like, oh, wow, that's a while. I'm like, well, we're a year and a half in and you're just now getting help. You know, we have to go collect all the pieces. We have to collect all of your emails. Mm -hmm. We have to see exactly where this claim was, where it went off the tracks, why they're not paying, you know, just the investigation side. You know, when we come on and it's a brand new case, they just submitted the claim. It's a clean slate. You know, we can really control the narrative and guide the process. When we come on later on, it's it's almost like you're doing a cold case investigation. We have to figure everything out. And by the time we do that and then start working on the case, you're a few months in, Um, you know, so. I everybody, it's up to, you know, them, how they want to handle their case, if they have the time like you have. Take on your insurance company loan and see yeah. if you can get it settled. But the problem is, you know, with inflation and everything else and things costing as much as they do, people are working as much as they can just to get by. A lot of people don't have the time, no. you know, to be on the phone hours a day with their insurance company. Well, and so so often we found uh, everyone said, oh, well, you should just take whatever they offer you. I'm just like, absolutely not. Well, it doesn't indemnify you. It doesn't no, get back what you lost. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, how could I take that? That was such a small amount compared to the loss that we had, Yes, you know? So, um, and, and I was in a, a, a unique position just, uh, from my former experience and just understanding the insurance age or the insurance business, um, a little bit more in depth than, you know, your average consumer out mm-hmm. there just from being a licensed rep here, you know? So, um, that gave me a little bit more confidence and, mm-hmm. uh, and being able to say, no, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> and and saying, I'm going to need to speak to someone else other than you because none of what you're telling me is true. And so often uh, I did find that. So is it, do you believe that people need to have uh, representation before they engage with you? Or will you engage with someone that doesn't have representation? Yeah. So we're normally the first round of representation they get. Yeah. Okay. So off of Hurricane Ian, I want to say right around like 88, 89% of our claims, we've settled on our own without having to have an attorney step in to actually file suit. You know, everything we do is pre-litigation. So we step in, you know, we build an estimate using, depending on who your insurance company is, we'll use their own computer software to actually build an estimate in their own language. That way you're comparing apples to apples. You know, we'll go out there, we'll request the re-inspections. Depending on the kind of damage you have, we're able to look at it and assess, all right, do we need a structural engineer? Do we not? You know, do we need a window engineer? Do we need a a mechanical engineer for the HVAC systems? So we basically help build the case in a way the insurance company can understand it in a little simpler terms. Because you also have to think, you know, insurance companies might have 30,000 cases and you're one of them. Right. You know, so when you're working with desk adjusters at insurance companies, 
I don't want to say they're lazy, but you know, they're paid to get these claims off their desktops. And the easier, if you can do all of the work for them where all they have to do is click one button that just says pay and that claim's done, it makes them look really good. Like they've done a lot of work, but we honestly do all You've of the work for them. <laughs> yeah. So our, our goal is to set these up to where we do everything to where the insurance company has a finished packet of work. They look at it and it's really hard for them to argue. And you know, 80 plus percent of the time we're able to do that. You know, there are the 10 percent or so of cases that we do have to move to litigation. Um, and we hate to do that because people might be in litigation for years against their insurance company. But, you know, it just came out. I believe it was Heritage Insurance just got a million dollar fine from the state of Florida, which a million dollar fine. I think they owe probably five hundred million dollars in claims right now. They haven't paid. Wow. So a million dollars is whatever. But yeah. the, the fact is the state fine them because they're not responding to people. They're not actively working in their claims. So in those cases, you know, we have a lot of clients that have heritage, a lot of big commercial properties we're working on right now have heritage and they just ghost you. They stop responding. They stop working with you. And in those cases, you do have to move to litigation, unfortunately. But yeah. if we can keep them out of that and get it resolved in, you know, three to six months, get you fully paid and on your way to living a normal life, that's that's always the goal. So um, it, it sounds like it's best to actually engage with you prior to yeah. um, seeking an attorney because it may save you from having to do that. Oh, yeah. I, I, most people who get a public adjuster involved early, 10% of the time have to go to litigation. Yeah. It's those who have waited a year plus trying to fight on their own. Sometimes those cases are so messy. And it, you have to keep in mind one really important thing with insurance companies. You know, anything you say is used against you. Um, anything. If, anything. Absolutely. If, anything. if you call yeah. the insurance company every single time, listen for it. It will tell you before you get on with your adjuster. You're on a recorded line. Mm -hmm. We do it for customer service satisfaction. No. And here's how we know that we have had, we had a case in litigation, uh, from a hurricane, uh, whichever hurricane hit the panhandle three or four years ago, I uh, hit a, was that Matthew? Uh, it was after Matthew. I think it started with an S, but it, it was the one that hit by Pensacola. Yeah. Um, we had a client uh, that we brought on, they hired us really late. We weren't able to get it resolved and it went to litigation. And about a week before trial, the insurance company sent over a recorded, conversation with the homeowner first called in the claim where the insurance company was asking some questions like, Oh, you know, the damage you're claiming, have you ever noticed it before? And it was an old woman. And she had said, you know, I think I've noticed some of it before in the past, but I think now it's worse. And they're like, so you think it was prior damage? Well, it could be. Well, that was, Man. that was it for the case. The, the yeah. attorney said, Hey, there's a high likelihood we'll lose this now because, and she said, I don't even remember making that call. And that's when we remind clients, anything you say, they're, they're going to ask you questions to where it might trip you up. You might just, you know, you're trying to be an honest homeowner. Right. But sometimes being overly honest, I mean, it, maybe you saw a small water stain in your bathroom because you have a small pipe leak, but the insurance company will structure it to say, oh, so, but it could be from the roof. I, I mean, it could be, but it's in the bathroom. I guess it could be a roof leak. Well, then after a hurricane, if you have a bunch of roof leaks, they're going to say, well, you've always had a leaky roof. Right. So right. You, you have to be very careful with what you say to the insurance companies. It's almost better to always keep everything in writing than it is to ever get on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a, a tough thing to navigate, uh, you know, and, and the, the hardest part I think, um, is as a person that went through it, you're not in a stable state of mind. Oh my gosh, that, you're, you're panicked. You, you, you if, absolutely are, if you, especially if you've had a lot of damage. You have a husband or wife, they're stressed. Oh man. And if you're the one answering the phone calls with the insurance companies, they constantly want updates, what's going on. Uh, it's a very, very stressful time for everyone. Yeah, and, and no matter how calm, cool, and collected you are, um, and when you're when you're going through the process, the process it's, it's not just frustrating because you don't know what you don't know. I mean, 99.9% .9 of people out there are not insurance agents or adjusters. Yeah. So they don't know what they don't know. And, and um, you know, they haven't made themselves a student of it because you trust the people mm -hmm. and you trust your agent and you trust that, hey, they're, I'm paying them a premium. They're going to protect me from apparel. And, you know, if that ever comes up, they'll handle it. Just like, just yeah. like the commercials say on every football game <laughs> I, I, that you watch. I, I love agents to death. I, I do. Yeah. So I'm not throwing agents under the bus. No, but no, no, no. Agents are great at selling policies, but they've never had to enforce a policy. Right. You know, for 10 years with the insurance companies, that's what I would do is I would enforce your insurance policy. I'd be the adjuster. We'd go off exactly what the policy says, and that's what we would have to pay you. And even working with the insurance companies, I mean, hundreds of times homeowners would be completely shocked when I told them something wasn't covered. And I would say, your agent never sold you this portion of the policy. Um, you know, a good example on uh, big commercial properties or homeowners associations, 
you know, I've had agents call me and say, you know, I can't believe the insurance company didn't pay for the debris removal. I, I sold that to my client. Um, well, you did sell it to your client. I completely agree. However, did you read the, did you read the endorsement for the debris right. removal? Some policies say we will cover debris removal up to $50,000 if it's debris that comes from the building, meaning like if the roof lands in the parking lot, the gutters. Well, what would happen is HOAs would have um, you know, debris removal companies come out there, but they would write the invoice wrong. It would say to clean tree debris in the parking lot when really the whole roof of the building is laying in the parking lot. And that's sure. really, there was maybe one, you know, one small shrub they had to clean up. But if they would have said clean debris from building in parking lot for 50000 paid instantly, just little things like that. Like people just don't realize, yes, you have coverage, but you have to make sure your invoices Anything that you had done to the house is worded correctly. Because a few words wrong, and the insurance company gets the first draft of it, you don't get to do it again. No. Oh, hey, hey, let me correct this. Oh, no, no, you already told us what it was for. Right. And it could be wrong. You know, you, you could be an innocent homeowner, and someone wrote down the invoice and used just a few wrong words. And again, you know, tree companies aren't insurance experts. You know, roofing companies aren't either. You know, they they just write an invoice. All they care about is, hey, I'm charging you 50k. You pay me the 50k. We're good. But a few wrong words. And, you know, that client doesn't get reimbursed from the insurance company for that. And it's just little things like that that people just, you know, have no idea about. Yeah. Um, and that list is ever growing that oh, people don't because they keep changing. They yeah. change it all the time and you get updates, uh, you know, on yeah. a quarterly basis of how they've they've changed some. Oh, well, we've we've reworded this. And nobody policy. reads it. No, of course nobody not. Now they're just the like, print. is it a bill? D am I canceled? Oh, no, I'm not. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, so, it, yeah. it, it even comes down to, uh, you know, realtors and people selling homes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, oh, hey, you know, I have a person who can give you an insurance policy. You know, this premium for the year is going to be 2500 but this premium is 3500 It doesn't matter what the premium is. I mean, I mean, the premium that I have on my house and the insurance company I have, it wasn't the highest price. It wasn't the lowest price. But what I requested from my agent I said, I want a full copy of the policy that would be used for this. And they're like, really? You, you want to read all that? Absolutely, I do. 1,000%. Yeah, that, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I read through seven or eight different insurance policies. I found one that I really liked. Mm -hmm. Again, it wasn't the cheapest. It wasn't the most expensive. And I said, this is the one I sure. want. And the agent's oh, really? Nobody ever picks this policy. I'm like, well, you should definitely sell it. <laughs> this, most, this is a great one for, you know, homeowners. Yeah, if you're recommending that, yeah, I, yeah, you would definitely want to sell that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, um, that's something that, you know, reading through the policies now, because, you know, you, you like you said, you normally just go, hey, let's just go with the cheapest one. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the most expensive thing that you will probably ever buy in your life, you don't want to go with the cheapest coverage. Oh, it, <laughs> at all. Oh, absolutely. It, it's funny because um, there's some uh, local politicians and even people that are on TV, you know, some news anchors, you know, because I've been on several different networks talking about insurance policies and the upcoming hurricane season. They whenever their policy is coming for a renewal, they text me. Hey, what does this mean in the policy? Hey, my agent says they can knock it down this much, but I won't have this. Is this good or bad? And sometimes I'm like, yeah, you can get rid of that. It's it's useless. You don't sure. need three hundred thousand dollars in contents coverage. You have a you know a hundred dollar couch in your house. You're you're fine. Yeah. You know, but there's other times they're like, hey, if I if I get rid of um, you know, this pool cage endorsement, well, well, well then you have no coverage for your pool cage. You mean right. if it gets blown away, I don't have coverage? No, you get zero. If you got a fifty thousand dollar pool cage, if you remove this from your policy, you'll never be paid for it ever again. Yeah. So there's, I get texts all the time from people that are like, Hey, you are our expert on TV. Do, do you mind <laughs> going through this and right. answering some questions for me? Because sometimes, you know, agents are busy. They can't get a hold of their agent. True. Um, so they'll, yeah, uh, people call me all the time. Hey, wh what do you, what do you think about this? And I always just try to steer them in the right direction. Well, it's good. It, you know, it's very valuable to have a friend like you, uh, to be able to, to guide them through that because man, uh, with it ever changing and with, um, it seems that there are more and more weather hazards out there. I, I mean, what we just have three weeks worth of nothing but, uh, oh, tornadoes throughout the Midwest. Yeah, we, we do. We have a lot of clients in Ohio, Indiana. So, so we work in, uh, you know, all over the Midwest. Uh, we have adjusters that we either fly out there or that live locally. And uh, it has been a nonstop busy year for us. You know, normally in Florida, this is our slow season. It's the dry season, you know, it, not much rain, no storms. But around the rest of the country, it's the start of storm season. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've got people in Missouri, Iowa. I mean, anywhere where you've seen a big tornado, we've probably got clients out there. And now we're getting ready to enter the stormy season of Florida. Yeah. You know, just a couple of years ago, I think it was Sebring, Florida had a baseball size hailstorm, something that you would think would only be in Texas or the Midwest, mm -hmm. knocked out windows of houses. Just we 
we had thousands of clients from that. You know, so you never know what you're going to get in Florida. You can get the hail, the wind, the tornadoes. You know, what was it, two, two or three years ago? I think we had a couple tornadoes come through Fort Myers. I mean, you just never know. So normally this would be our slow season, but we're bit, probably busier than ever. <laughs> and we're not even to hurricane season yet. Yeah. And that's the scary thing. And I do want to ask you about the state of insurance in Florida, because um, with the, the the consistency uh, ramping up of you know, storms and damage uh, over the last five or six years, uh, what have you noticed? I mean, we know that there have been insurance uh, companies just close up and, and close up shop and leave. Um, are you starting to see that change a little bit now? That is a great question. I, I could do a whole podcast <laughs> on this, me and politicians that I debate with here locally. Um, state of insurance in Florida is always going to be a little wild because you always yeah. are going to have hurricanes and natural disasters. You know, we, we went the longest stretch in recorded human history of no hurricanes in Florida. I think it was between 2004 to 2017. Mm -hmm. We had nothing, not a single eyewall come on shore. But we still had the highest premiums in the entire country by far, higher than California, higher than New York. Insurance companies should have made billions and billions in profits, and they did. Mm -hmm. But did they spend it wisely, and what did they do with the money? That was the big key when a lot of these insurance companies after Irma said, oops, no money. That, you know... Uh, I think it was Tampa Bay Times started, you know, writing stories. Where's the money? Where did right. it all go? And it was insane corporate bonuses to people, insane um, purchases. You know, I think it was UPC spent $35, $40 million, decided to open up a massive campus when in today's world of Zoom and everything else, it's there's it's almost pointless. Sure. Most insurance jobs, I mean, we don't even have, we have one small office with all of the employees that we have just because some people like to work in an office. But after COVID, we went Zoom and digital and everything, and we've never been more efficient than we are today. Absolutely. Some of the biggest law firms that we work with have sold their offices and have one small office space for a few people to answer phones. So insurance companies making wild purchases, crazy bonuses to executives was a big issue. It seems like now that's being a lot more regulated. You're seeing that talked about in the news. Hey, what are the insurance companies doing with the profits they're making? Are they spending it wisely and saving it for a rainy day? Because every year is not going to be like last year where it was, you know, no major hurricane hit a you know major uh, populated area. So the state of insurance in Florida, we're always going to have hurricanes. Um, you know, another thing that makes these storms, you know, so, so expensive is the cost of real estate in Florida. I mean, look at between COVID and now, how much a home cost to buy or fix, you know, all those materials have doubled. Well, premiums have to go up as well because sure. now those same homes that that roof six years ago cost 50 K now that roof cost a hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, getting back to the point of insurance in Florida, as long as the insurance companies, um, you know, manage their money correctly, I think we're going to be fine. And that's the biggest key is how, how will these insurance companies handle the money? Now, I know there's a bunch of law changes that happened a few years ago too, where you did have some bad actors, some bad contractors that were just suing insurance companies on absolutely everything because the penalties you could get against insurance companies it, kind of manipulating the system. Well, they've outlawed AOBs, assignment of benefits. So you can't have contractors now that are signing up clients. They take over the claim from you as a homeowner, and then they actually are now in possession of your claim and they can do whatever they want with it, sue the insurance company. Now that we've gotten rid of that, yeah. you know, now you see more insurance companies coming here to Florida. So that's the one thing I can pat the politicians on the back. We had to get rid of that. But the problem in Florida is the pendulum always swings one extreme or the other. Very mm -hmm. rarely in politics are we somewhere where it makes sense. Um, the big thing that I see that nobody's really talking about now, but if Miami or somewhere gets hit with a hurricane, it'll be a major story, is we have take away, taken away the attorney fee provision. Um, to where before, even with uh, Ian, if you had to sue your insurance company, your attorney, assuming you prevail, could recover his attorney's fees. That is now gone. Anything that happens now from this day moving forward with a hurricane, let's say you have a million dollars worth of damage. If you have to hire an attorney and go to litigation, 25, 30% of that goes to the attorney. So you're only getting 700,000. The rest is coming out of your pocket. Wow. So attorneys now cannot get their fees. Now- Part of that is it's going to keep me busier, you know, because we're not near as sure. expensive as an attorney. So people want to hire us, hoping that we can get it settled without having to go to litigation. But for those that do have to go to litigation, you know, even if it's even if it's proven that your insurance company 
stopped answering their phones. They weren't doing what they're supposed to. What's the penalty? There is none. The insurance company now just has to pay the claim and the attorney's fees come out of your pocket, even though it might be your insurance company who is completely in the wrong. Um, and a lot of people aren't really talking about that now, but the next hurricane that hits, whether it's here, Tampa, Miami, Jacksonville, it's going to be a major point of conversation. And my guess would be you're going to see that law come right back. But unfortunately for the next hurricane we have, those people are going to, it's going to hurt. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're a, you know, if you're a home on a fixed income and you have a hundred thousand dollars in damage and you have to hire an attorney and now you're only getting 70 K you're going to have to find a way to get by with that. And that $30,000 you need Man. isn't, it's not coming. Wow. So what can consumers do when they're looking for insurance? I mean, I, and I know you, we can't really paint it with a broad brush because there's so many different types of insurance, Yeah. but are there's a, a couple of things that they can be on the lookout for to make sure of, I mean, that, that you could recommend. Yeah. I, I can give you a couple. Okay. Um, RCV versus ACV, replacement cost versus actual cash value. What that is, uh, let's just say you have a Toyota Corolla that's 10 years old and you crash it. Well, your insurance company owes you for a 10-year-old Toyota Corolla. They're not buying you a brand new one. That is an ACV policy. So an example is, you know, you have a uh, roof that gets damaged that's 10 years old. It's meant to last 30 years. Well, they're going to depreciate that 33% and they're going to give you the money that's left over. Now you're going to have to come out of pocket for the rest. That's an ACV policy. Uh, an RCV policy, which most homeowners have, means if your roof's 10 years old and they were to depreciate it, maybe it was only worth 60,000, you're still going to get the full 90. You know, maybe when you put on that roof 10 years ago, that roof only cost, you know, 60 or 70,000, but now it costs 90. You're going to get whatever the current market rate is, whether that's a roof, whether that's windows that were knocked out, flooring damage, RCV. So having a replacement cost policy is important. The thing you have to be careful of, there's a lot of agents selling policies right now and they say, oh, it's an RCV policy. However, it's ACV on your roof. The roof's always okay. one of the most important things. You want to make sure your roof is replacement cost coverage as well, just like the rest of the house, because the cost of roofs nowadays is absolutely insane. You got to take out a second mortgage. It's, you can, <laughs> the cost of, if you have a large home here in Collier County or even Lee County, that's a tile roof. Mm hmm for the cost of your roof, you can almost buy a starter home in the Midwest. It is oh, yeah. insane yeah. right now, roof cost in Florida. So making sure your roof is RCV, yeah. the amount of people that I have that didn't know they had ACV on the roof after the storm, and I have to say, hey, your roof was about halfway through its life expectancy. I know you were expecting 100, but you're getting 50,000. That's $50,000 they had to come out of pocket now for the roof, and they were already paying $10,000 a year in premium. Right. And their question is, why do I even have insurance? Yeah. Well, it, it, a, lot, a lot of people have asked me that this year. Why do I even have it? Um, you know, the second most important thing is making sure that you have coverage for your screened in aluminum enclosure, your lanai. So many people called me. My insurance company won't pay for my lanai. The very first thing I do when we're going to take on a client, we say, we need a copy of your policy. We either get it from you or your agent. And then they have no coverage for it. Okay. Agents forgot to sell them an endorsement for the lanai because it's a separate structure. There is one or two policies out there where it's included in the actual structure of their home, but most you have to buy a separate endorsement. And the sad thing is some of those endorsements are $200 for the year. And that $200 a year costs them 50 plus thousand dollars on a lanai. Wow. People just have zero, zero idea about those kinds of things. And it's, it's heartbreaking when I have to be the one to tell people your insurance company paid you everything they could based on the contract you have with them, which is your policy. And you've got a really bad policy. But you do something that not everybody does. You have a website. You, yeah. You're active, um, not just on social, but on television, like you said earlier. Yeah. Um, but you also go through an education process with people, uh, not you know from your website and from your socials. Yeah, we, we do actually do um, once or twice a year. We'll actually do like a small, uh, like a little conference. Sometimes we'll do it at the Hilton in Naples. Um, we'll move it around. But something to just make the public aware, like, hey, these changes have happened in your insurance policies. And every time we do one of these, we have a completely packed room because there's not a lot of people that are doing these insurance presentations. You know, sometimes agents are, but they're more trying to sell you. Like I have nothing to sell you. Like I, I, I make no money by giving you advice on your insurance policy. Right. You know, I make money by, you know, representing you if you have an insurance problem, but we're trying to prevent people from having the problems to begin with because, you know, we've been blessed to have as much business as we can, but most of the time we have more business than we can actually handle. 
So if we can actually just help people to not get in the situations they're in, because I, I can't tell you how often uh, some of the girls from our office just love what they do, because when they go deliver a hundred thousand dollars check to a homeowner yeah. who had given up hope, I can't tell you how many times that they'll be bawling their eyes out and like hugging one of our girls in the office when they go deliver that check. Cause to them, that was the difference between having to sell their home or getting to keep what they have. Um, so we, we host a lot of these different things just to try to educate the public. And honestly, we actually have some agents, you know, new younger agents that show up because they get to hear from our perspective, how a lot of these policies enforced and certain endorsements that maybe they need to be selling that they weren't aware of, you know, were a big need to the public. Yeah, that's so important. And really, if they get educated by you and they get a policy based upon the information you provided yeah. and they find themselves in a circumstance where the insurance company is not cooperating, then it's easy to call you and you go, well, you took all my advice and now you have all the coverages you need. And that puts yeah. you, would that not put you in a better position to help them? Oh yeah. Um, I did a Zoom call with a couple about a week ago and they said, I don't know if you can help us. And they gave me their policy and I read through it and it was an amazing policy. The agent sold them a great policy. The insurance company just didn't do them any favors. Wow. And I said, Hey, I've read through your policy. I'm, I can't promise anything, but I'm extremely confident. Not only will we get you paid for the roof, but all of your, everything you've lost, you have coverage for, and you have very good policy that's written to lean towards your argument that you're making. Um, so yeah, sometimes when I read a policy, I can tell a homeowner, I can't guarantee, but I can come close to that telling you we're going to get this settled and you're going to get paid out. There's other times I read a policy and I tell homeowners, this is an uphill battle. Expect this to take a year plus. I will do everything in my power. I just don't want to give you a lot of hope, but if we can pull off a miracle, we'll do it. And sometimes we can, yeah. other times we can't. Um, but we try to give people realistic expectations. And I think that's what's different about us compared to some other companies. Other companies want to say, oh, well, we always settle. We always do this. We don't always settle. Depending on what your policy is kind of determines if we feel good, if we're going to settle, if we're going to say, hey, it's a long shot, but we're going to see if it sticks. And some people like our brutal honesty. I'll say your policy is garbage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some people like to hear it. Other people get offended by it. But we we are who we are. We just we try to give people the real expectation of kind of what's going to happen in the process. So it's time to talk about the alligator in the basement. This is like the elephant. Oh, in the gosh. Room. We got to talk about the alligator in the basement. So. <laughs> What, what was this circumstance? How did this even come about? The amount of insane things I've seen, because <laughs> you have to think for 10 years, I represented insurance companies. I'd probably handle a thousand claims a year on a thousand claims a year. You got to, you have to think you're normally meeting a husband and wife. Sometimes they're kids and normally they're contractor. So on a thousand claims a year, I'm meeting 3000 plus people for 10 years. Um, I saw the most insane things. I mean, I've got crazy stories, but I'll tell you the alligator one. Uh, we believe it was Superstorm Sandy hit uh, Long Island, New York, and northern mm -hmm. New Jersey. And absolute chaos. You know, New York hadn't had a hurricane hit in a long, long oh, time. Yeah. Nobody knew what the heck to do. There was extreme coastal flooding. Brooklyn was flooded. It, it was an absolute mess. Uh, so I'm staying out on Long Island, and I'm working uh, Montauk all the way to the Hamptons, which is a really fun area to work. You know, I got oh, I to bet. spend, you know, almost a year out there, you know, working that area. Beautiful area. So we're working and I get to a house and I'm, I'm not there for the flood, but I'm there for the wind damage. But the insurance company uh, had requested that I still take photos of some of the flood damage and this house had a basement. So as you can imagine, it was completely full of water, as full as you could be. Yeah. And uh, I get there, I take photos of the outside of the house. We're, you know, we're writing up the estimate for the homeowner. We're getting them taken care of. And I'm like, hey, do you mind if I get just a few pictures of the basement? They're like, no, 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 no problem. And we get to the stairs of the basement and uh, the homeowner turns and says, are you okay with exotic pets? And I'm, oh, first, no, are you okay with pets? Yeah, I don't mind pets, dog, cats, you know, whatever. Are you okay, okay with exotic pets? I'm, how like, exotic? How, how exotic are we talking here? <laughs> and uh, we're going down the stairs, and she says, we have an alligator. And I'm like, we're in New York. <laughs> right. Oh, we, we brought it back uh, with us from Florida when my kids were really young, and now they're all in college, and we don't know what to do with this alligator. I'm like, Okay. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's five or six foot alligator. I'm like, okay, that's, but it's not in a cage. And I'm like, what? Why is it in a cage? She was like, what do you mean? And I'm she like, looks at me like I'm the crazy one. She was like, well, how else are we going to get the fish out of the basement? And I'm like, the fish, she was like, this whole area flooded. The fish poured in the windows. We didn't want to pick them all up. And we normally feed the alligator fish. So we have them down there. 
I kid you not, we go downstairs. <laughs> he was this, feasting. This alligator sees us and he like <laughs> hunkers down and he goes, Hiss, like makes this little hissing noise. And there's, it smells like dead fish everywhere. And there oh. are these, I don't even know what they are, these silver fish that have flooded through the windows during the storm surge. And I'm trying to stay away from the alligator. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like a, a real life alligator. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, taking measurements of the basement with a laser, you know, so I don't have to walk around much. But she's like, yeah, kick a, kick a fish over the alligator. And I kick a fish over. He just turns his head, gets it, flips it in the air and eats it. And I'm like, and that was just one of the dozens and dozens of crazy things that I saw. Of wow. all places to run into an alligator, that would be the last, I would think, would be the place that that would happen. One more story. I'll tell you like a bonus story. Bonus um, story. That's right. Listen up. We got a bonus story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck Norris. The, the man, the myth, the legend. So many memes, so many jokes about Chuck Norris. <laughs> yeah. I was in Indianapolis and Chuck Norris, I guess, has a big family, a lot of cousins. And the client I have that I'm going out uh, for a hailstorm to look at his roof, his last name is Norris. Norris is a common last name. It's like the last oh, yeah. name is Smith. You don't think yeah. about it. So I'm up on the roof with a contractor. He says, hey, this is Chuck Norris's cousins. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. He's like, yeah, they did karate together for years. He has, has a whole trophy room you walk into, and it's the whole Norris family, and it's all their trophies and all their karate things. I'm like, no way. So we go in, and I ask the guy, I'm like, hey, I don't know if the contractor's messing with me. I, you know, at the time, I was in my early 20s. I was like, oh, this guy set me up to look stupid. Oh, yeah. And I was like, are you related to Chuck Norris? And he kind of looks at me, and I'm like, oh, this was a stupid question. He was like, follow me. And I'm like, okay. So he's leading me through this house that I've never been in in my life. He leads me into a room, and it's all these trophies and everything. It's him and Chuck Norris and the Norris family and all their karate. And I'm like, oh, this is really cool. And out of nowhere, this guy, and this guy was probably early 70s, does like this roundhouse kick in front of me. And he says, you don't mess with a Norris. And he just looks me in the <laughs> eyes, dead, like not even smiling. And I'm like, this is pretty wild. And then he starts laughing. I was like, oh, I was like, I was, that was intense. <laughs> then, yeah. And that's why they have so many memes about Chuck Norris. Him and his family are wild. I mean, yeah, all, yeah the, the cousin and the wife that I met, they're awesome people. And they're telling me yeah. all these family stories. But yeah, you, you meet a lot of, a lot of politicians, a lot of uh, like, B and C list celebrities, you know, because they have homes too and the homes get damaged and hey, you meet a lot of really cool people in that industry. And now that I'm on, you know, now that I'm representing the public, we don't handle near the volume that I used to because back when you work with the insurance companies, you'll handle seven to, ten, seven to 10 claims a day. You write the estimates, you go on to the next one. You know, when we're working with clients, you know, we have those clients for months and months and months. You know, we don't handle 10, 20, 30,000 claims a year. You know, we'll take like 5,000. So we meet a lot of cool people. But when I was in my 20s and you're traveling all over, you met some wild, wild people. <laughs> I bet it is, it is the common denominator. It is an equalizer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not always the best kind of equalizer, but it really does um, give you that perspective that, Hey, those are just people too. And they have ups and downs in life like everybody else. And they just like everybody else know nothing about insurance. Nothing. And you're the first person they've talked to that knows a dang thing about insurance. Yeah. Um, it has uh, been awesome to talk to you. I've got a couple of questions for you though. Right. Um, we're going to do a new segment. Uh, that right. you you actually inspired. So uh -oh. um, it's our top five tips from uh, our from our guests. So um, and if you've only got a couple, that's fine. Um, but top five tips um, to settle an insurance claim quickly. Yep. What would you say would be the top five? Number one, by far, is going to be take photos before you evacuate, or you know, if it, even of your home, if it's not a hurricane situation, maybe you had a fire or something happened. Every year, go around, take a video of the outside of, you, of the building or your home and the inside. You know, I think so many people focus on, oh, let me take photos of the inside. The outside's just as important. You know, windows, doors, and roofs cost a lot of money nowadays. Oh, yeah. I mean, they might be as much money as the whole interior of your home, the way things are going with the current market. Um, if you have before photos, before an event happens, it makes it really hard for the insurance company to say, oh, your roof was always like that. Oh, your, uh, your stucco always had that crack. Oh, your window was always leaking. You know, having before photos really pins an insurance company in a position where they're almost forced to pay. And if you would do that little thing, I bet 50% of our clientele wouldn't need us just before photos. It's, it's so wildly important. Um, second one, having the right policy, uh, making sure your policy is replacement cost. Um, How often should someone check or, or update their policy? Is that just an annual thing you should just do like, uh, you know, clockwork? What you should do is every year your insurance company renews your policy. Most insurance companies send you 
really fine print email. Hey, we renewed your policy, but there were a few changes. Call your agent and ask what those changes are. And even better yet, maybe email your agent so he can actually write it out for you so you remember what those changes are. Yeah. Um, having RCV and knowing what those changes are in your policy is going to be huge. Um, probably third most important thing you can do, whoever you hire to do your emergency repairs after an event, make sure they take photos before they do any kind of repairs or before they cover something with a tarp. Um, I can't tell you how many times where a roofer will go out and uh, patch up a roof in a bunch of different spots. And then I get on the claim and I say, hey, I need all the before photos. Well, for the insurance company, they show up and there's a roof that's patched up. And they say, oh, you've got a roof with a bunch of patches. You must have been patching it for the last couple of years. Of course, they're going to say that. Of course, they're going to say but that. But if you yeah. can say, oh, no, here was it before. Here was the damage before. It was down to the plywood decking. Mm -hmm. um, always make sure before anybody does repairs of your home, tell them that you want before and after photos. Again, we'd probably lose the other half of our clients if people, <laughs> if people would just do the you know that simple thing. Uh, what does it be? Fourth most important thing you can do. Um, if you have a lanai, make sure you have coverage for it. Oh, yeah. So many people don't know that you have to have coverage for lanai and you have to have coverage for other structures. Other structures would be anything um, that is not your home. So that's going to be your fence. If you have a separate garage, if you have a shed, if you have a gazebo, all of those are going to be other structures. Make sure not only you have coverage for other structures, but you have enough. Right. I, I've seen so many policies here in uh, Naples and Fort Myers, Cape Coral, Punta Gorda, where they have three or $4,000 in other structures coverage, but they have you know, a thousand foot of fence around their yard. Exactly. Yeah. The, the fence thing, it really, you know, I mean, those, are, that adds up quickly. People don't realize how much a vinyl or wood fence is nowadays. Yeah. I mean, two sections of fence, you've already ate up your $3,000 <laughs> Exactly. and you've got 50 sections of fence around your yard. It's, Let's just do a really nice gate. <laughs> that's all you can do is so yeah. many people have called me saying my insurance company really stuck it to me on the fence. And I look at their policy. I'm like, you only have $3,000 in coverage on your fence. Yeah. There's nothing we can do. So make sure you have coverage for your other structures. Make sure you have coverage for your lanai. Yeah. Um, probably the last and you know last tip I can give you, it's going to be associated with insurance policies. Make sure you have what they call O and L, ordinance and law coverage. So many people don't know what that is. I'm saying it right now and people think it's probably completely foreign. Mm -hmm. Ordinance and law is the cost for any kind of a code upgrade. So let's just say whatever you have, let's just say your windows is a great example. If your house is built 80s, 90s, you probably just have single pane windows. Mm -hmm. Well, now the county is not going to let you go back with a single pane window. They want you to go back with some kind of impact resistant glass. Well, an insurance policy is replacement cost coverage. You get the brand new version of what you have. So you're going to get a brand new high end single pane window, but the county is going to say, no, 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 you need to upgrade to impact, which is double the cost. Well, under a normal insurance policy, that comes out of your pocket. But if you have ordinance and law coverage, mm -hmm. it comes out of the insurance companies. It's an additional coverage on top to where now they actually owe for whatever the code upgrade is. If the code requires that impact window, you now have coverage for that. And again, that's a, a few hundred dollar premium in your policy to have ordinance and law coverage. But people don't realize how much windows are. I, I, yeah. have, I have some nice homes who the county's requiring all the windows be replaced. 50 to maybe 75, $80,000. I have some homes that have almost a $200,000 window bid from multiple different contractors wow. over on Sanibel or North Captiva Island. Windows can add up to a lot, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And making sure you have ordinance and law coverage, which costs you a couple extra hundred dollars a year, split that up between 12 months. It's it's not big on your premiums. Yeah. Very, very important to have. That is That was one of the most mind-blowing things was how important that small little paragraph is. Yep. It's one paragraph and how in the middle of 100 pages. Yeah, and how inexpensive it truly is it really and is. adds up. Um, that made all the difference on our policy. Oh, the it ordinance and law? Absolutely made yep. all the difference. And it gave me ground to stand on. When I went to talk to them, they were like, well, you know, because if they peel something back and they replace this, well, anything that touches that, um, they have to bring that up to code to as code. well. Yep. And so that just really reinforces that. So, yeah, that's how that's how we got paid out. Yep. Again, yep. a couple hundred dollars in a premium, something that That's you didn't it. even know was in your policy can save your butt and save you hundred, 200 plus thousand. Or even if you have a house that, you know, let's say you have really bad damage and it's at policy max ordinance and law is an additional coverage on top. 
So if you're insured for a million dollars and you have ordinance and law coverage at 25%, which is kind of the standard, mm -hmm. that's an extra $250,000 you get on top of your million dollars to rebuild your home and bring it all the way to code. Yeah. It's one of the most important things you can have in your policy. I will say probably 75% of people have it, but most people don't even know they have it. Right. So, and depending on how nice your home is. Now, you would think the nicer your home is, the more ordinance and law coverage you want, but it's actually the opposite. If your home was built here recently, it's already up to code. Yeah. So you're probably not going to have to worry about it. You know, having the minimum 25% ordinance and law is fine. You have an older home though, built in oh, the 70s, man. 80s, the old yeah. style ranch. I'd have, if I were you, I'd have 50% ordinance mm -hmm. and law and see what that price difference is in your policy. You know, it's not too significant. Go with it yeah. because you're going to have so many things. You're electrical and nothing in your house is going to be up to code if the county wants you to rebuild everything. Having that in there is going to be a lifesaver for you. Yeah. And so many people will say, well, chances are nothing's ever going to happen. You're right. But don't you want to be protected if it does? My friends for years had no idea what I did. I used to explain to them all the time and nobody was like, yeah, Blake, that's something about it. Are you an agent? You're an agent, right? No, I'm not an agent. No, yeah. I'm an adjuster. Nobody knew, no, nobody knows what an adjuster is until your area gets a major tornado. Mm -hmm. My small little hometown where I went to high school and college got hit with their first big tornado and hailstorm they probably had in 50 years. So many of my friends from high school are calling me like, hey, you, you're an insurance adjuster, right? But, but you work for me and not the insurance company because their, their first experience with an insurance adjuster, even knowing what the term is, is the guy from State Farm or Nationwide or whoever right. that showed up to their house. So, so many of my friends I went to high school with now have been calling me like crazy this summer because they're like, oh my God, we understand what you do now, you know, because it is kind of a little niche, you know, industry and you know, a lot of people don't know a lot about it unless you're in Florida and you get hit with hurricanes. Well, but sure, yeah. Outside of Florida, a lot of people don't know what an adjuster is until they have a fire, yeah. you know, until someone drives a car into their house or they have a hailstorm or an earthquake or something. That's when they find out the hard way and they're like, oh, I think Blake does that. And I get a lot of calls. So, um, you know, people don't know about these things in their policy until you have to use them, unfortunately. Well, this has been great, man. Uh, wonderful information. Not just wonderful, uh, but but valuable. Uh, so thank you for taking time. Happy uh, to be here. It was fun. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you had fun. We'd love to have you back. We can talk about this stuff all day. And I actually, we could probably do a show just on all of the crazy experiences that you've had while doing this. So I have. we'll have to do that. Yeah. Sometimes we'll go out with friends and have a few drinks and that'll be the topic of conversation. Hey, Blake, yeah. tell us some of the craziest <laughs> stories. I've, I've got a laundry list of ridiculous stories and... Uh, now, I'm always happy to talk about them. <laughs> well, don't be one of those crazy stories that he has <laughs> to tell people. Uh, but uh, if you want to find out more information, then we want to send them to blakeadjusting.com, right? Uh, dayadjusting.com. Oh, I'm sorry, day, dayadjusting.com. Yep, go to dayadjusting.com. Um, yeah, you look at our Facebook page, our Instagram page. We're always putting out some kind of content. Um, if you watch, you know, here locally, Wink, Fox, yep. NBC, a lot of times they have me on there as their insurance professional to talk about different things. So, yeah, just... Uh, Look for us. You'll find us. <laughs> so they are the people to know uh, anytime that you have that kind of issue going on. So make sure you connect with them on their socials as well and check out all the educational pieces that he has. Uh, so um, be sure to check us out on Spotify now uh, and on all our socials. Be sure to connect and also uh, chime in. We want to hear what you think. We want to hear about your experiences that you may have had uh, because we really want to be a, a community that helps one another. Uh, so uh, don't forget, we've got another episode coming up uh, and where we're going to actually uh, be on the other side of this. Uh, our friends, the Frolofts that own Max Effect Computers, they, um, they actually experienced a fire. And um, they're having some trouble getting paid out. Uh, so there's probably someone we want to introduce <laughs> you to. Um, but we're going to be interviewing them. We're going to talk about all the things that they've got going on. And, um, you know, they, they're really got uh, good friends of ours. And uh, we're, we're grateful to have them, too. So make sure you check that out. And um, check out Business Confidential and Guerrilla Media. And remember, Business Confidential, it's our business to know your business. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you soon.